Well, I thought what we were talking about earlier was, was good, just before I, I rudely interrupted with this whole camera thing. Um, you were talking about how going out and preaching was confrontation. Uh, I thought that was a good line of, uh, of um, thought. Maybe we could explore it some more. Um, <coughs> First the tapasya, then the bliss. Yeah. In other words, say you go through Prabhupada's Gita, and if you went line by line in his purports, and you analyzed each sentence on this basis, the analysis would be how many of the sentences are neutral they give knowledge transcendental information how many of these sentences are negative quote unquote he's criticizing something he's exposing something he's condemning something and how many of the sentences are quote unquote positive now we know from the from the absolute perspective, that every single sentence would fall under the category of being absolute positive. But I'm talking here in regard to, on the relative plane, how they, how a person would say that is a negative sentence, that is a positive sentence, that is a neutral sentence. Right. So that intelligence or that analysis is not entirely uh, to be ignored. It's there. You would find more negative than positive. You would find more criticism, more judgmentalism, quote-unquote, more confrontation, more condemnation. So why is that? For example, how many of us, you and I have talked about this previously, how many of us even heard of a Mayavadi or the philosophy of Mayavadi before we became devotees? Would you say even one in a hundred? If yeah. we take the non-Indian. Yeah, easy. Less than one in a hundred or one in a hundred. But right from the gate, Mayavadi. All, in so many of Prabhupada's purports, in so many of his lectures, morning walks, why is that? Because it's going to have to be confronted up the road mm. by everybody, by all these new devotees. They don't know it, but on a very subtle platform, Mayavad's already present in them. Mm. So you would go out in the beginning and if you take the attitude that I will attract members to our movement, to our temple, to our Sankirtan party, I will do that through attracting them. All right. That's a nice tactic. And it can be effective. But is that really what needs to be done in the beginning? Are you going to attract people who are looking for sense gratification by offering a so-called better sense gratification? When the whole purpose of all yoga systems is navritti marg. Pravritti marg can be interpreted in two ways, both the same ultimately. Namely, pravritti marg in its real sense, the term Vedic, is to follow the karmakanda, to worship the demigods, recognizing Vishnu, recognizing the supreme demigod, the Parameshwar, and perform the yagyas to the demigods as agents, but perform the demigods' sacrifices to them in order to please them and then to get material rewards from them. It's, it's almost entirely activity in the mode of goodness, although there is some passion there. It certainly is not activity in the mode of ignorance. Mm. That's one definition of pravritti marg. Then that's the that's the Vedic narrow definition of pravritti marg. The expansive definition of pravritti marg is all endeavor in the material world to try to get things of this world, to try to get uh, happiness from this world, to try to aggrandize within this world. 
to enjoy sense gratification in this world, to enjoy honor, to enjoy profit, adoration, and distinction, to have something where you've accomplished something in this world. That's, that's the expansive Pravritti Marg. Of course, all of that Pravritti Marg in the context of Kali Yuga means that you get tremendous, you're, you're burdening yourself with tremendous amount of vik karma or negative karma, so that then at the time of death, you've lost eligibility to remain human. Because mm. that's what the animals are doing. Everybody is trying to not only survive, survival is, of course, ultra important, but also to, quote unquote, th thrive, quote unquote, enjoy, sense gratification, etc. So, if the goal of bringing devotees into the movement is to attract them, well, what are they going to be attracted by? They're not going to be attracted by the pastimes of the Supreme Lord in the spiritual world with, the, with rare exceptions. They're not going to be attracted by, by that. So first, it has to be peeled away all the covering, or at least as much as possible. Mm. And that's done through confrontation by saying, have you really thought about it? That all it, what you're doing is going to culminate in death. So therefore, is there really any value in what you're doing? So if the comebacker is, uh, well, you say you transcend death. How is that? We're, you're going to die, I'm going to die. How do you transcend death? Well, you don't know the art of dying then. You don't know how to transcend death. You can take a cheap attitude about it and say that oh, God will protect you, etc. But how is that being proven in your life anyway? There is a secret to the art of dying. There is a way to transcend death. You have to know what it is. And how do you know? Through practical realization. How do you know something sweet? When you taste it and the sweet is right there. And you say, well, that's sweet. Hmm. So if you've actually transcended death, then that means, what does it mean? Janma karma chame divyam evang yoveti tatvataha tatvyang dehang punar janma naitiman eti sarjana. You have the transcendental pastimes of the Lord playing in your mind like watching a television, the transcendental TV. And that's not awarded easily. That's awarded after thousands and thousands of yagyas that actually please the Supreme Lord. And that's why I say, first comes the tapasya, then the bliss. Mm -hmm. Tapasya means voluntary acceptance of pain for the purpose of self-realization. Voluntary acceptance of authorized pain. Not concocted, but authorized. That taking on this pain, penance and austerity, Penance and austerity. Austerity means you have an opportunity to enjoy something. Oh, very easy to take it. It's right there. And you don't. That's called being austere. And penance means you take on unnecessary suffering that you don't need to take on. But you take it on because it helps you advance in spiritual life. That's tapasya. These terms, penance and austerity, they can apply materially, but then they're not called tapasya. Tapa means to burn. Mm. Just like uh, I've experienced this in the cold water. Uh, if you take a, a cold shower under the cistern with the temperature at 33 degrees or something, and the cold water hits you, if you really analyze the pain that you're undergoing, it's almost... This seems contradictory, but if you really analyze it, it's like it's burning also. Mm -hmm. And we all know about what's called hot ice. So that it actually burns, but it works like ice. So pain, tapa, means it burns. You can't totally be comfortable in the material world for very long. You can maybe for an hour or two be comfortable. Uh, and you have to spend all kinds of money, time, energy, and be really fussy about it. And then your your physical body's comfortable for a short time, and then you're a little too cold, a little too hot, mm. a little too hungry, whatever it might be, it breaks down. 